Hey, good morning, Leadville Racers. My name is Mike Iddings, and I am the host of the YouTube channel, Get My Buckle. This channel is all about Leadville, whether it's the town, the people, the race, the racers, the course, whatever it is. Our guest today is quite the accomplished cyclist. Uh, it is Alexi Vermeulen. And just so everybody knows, to wish him luck and send him some good karma, on May 13th, he's going to be at the national championships and he's going to be trying to get in uh, to the Olympics this year. So, first of all, good luck, Alexi. And secondly, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Excited to chat about Leadville. All about Leadville. It's all about the buckle. Right? <clears throat> it, it definitely is. I haven't had a a moment to wear my buckle out yet, but I'm always looking for it. Oh, really? I, mine's on three different belts and I wear it every day. <clears throat> all of them. Yeah. I... Sometimes I think about going to Trader Joe's with it, but I just don't want to scare anybody. So <laughs> you just got to find the right timing. Maybe someday I'll feel ready. All right. So, you know, what, uh, what, where did you get to, when did you get to the point or how did you get to the point where you said, you know what, I'm going to, with all my other experience, I'm going to, I'm going to take on Leadville. I want to, you know, I want to give Leadville some hell. Yeah. Um, I grew up racing on the road. Uh, so Leadville was really never on my, something I looked at. I obviously heard about it and knew about it growing up. Uh, it's kind of an iconic race, but I would say as I was kind of trying to decide what I wanted to do, um, uh, I think the first time I really noticed how hard and how epic Leadville was, was the same as a lot of people watching Lance take it on. And it was something that was like coming from the road. You're like, wow, that is intense. If, if, if he's a roadie and he can do it, maybe I can do it. Uh, Cause I'd always kind of mountain bikes as a kid growing up, but nothing, nothing uh, intense. And so as my career kind of transitioned from the road to gravel slash mountain bike, um, my girlfriend and I actually moved out to Boulder, Colorado during that time and started to realize how close I was to Leadville and maybe get excited about taking it on myself. Uh, COVID happened, took a hiatus year, but then in 2021, uh, I did Leadville for the first time. Uh, I tried to explain to people coming from a Michigan kid or growing up in Michigan, I was definitely scared of it. It didn't matter how many hours I put it on the bike, just how high it started, how much you climbed, how fast you descended. Um, in 2021, I finished, but it was one of the hardest things I'd done to that point. Uh, just suffered all day. And I was ninth. And I said, okay, if we come back, maybe I'm going to try to do a little bit of altitude. And yeah, I think from there, it's just been a, exciting progression for me because as a professional racer Leadville is one of those things that it's not unbound it's not 10 hours for us it's six hours it's very calculated it's very direct you know exactly how long it's going to take you to climb columbine you know exactly where you're grabbing bottles it's very fast um and i've always just loved those races that are kind of all in or all out you have it or you don't and yeah it'll draw me back <laughs> probably till i finish racing wow so where are you from in michigan uh, I was born in Memphis and grew up uh, near Ann Arbor since I was like three. Really? I grew up near Ann Arbor. Ida. This is the, this is the, Ida. Yeah, I know exactly where it is. This is this the best part about cycling is this such a small world. That's awesome. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Michigan so, makes people tough. That's why you're a good cyclist. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so year one, you got ninth. And what? You're in, inside. You're like ninth isn't good enough. It wasn't even that. I just knew that, knew what was left on the table. Um, I think anyone who's done Lando before can attest to feeling like they overpaced or underpaced in a, in, a, in a certain area or should have drank a bottle here or, you know, should have sat on a group there. Um, and I think I left having learned so much about the course and the race that I was like, even if I was the same fitness level, I know I could do better than this. Um, and I think as a competitive person, you just you want to see what you can do each year. Well, for sure. Cause I, well, yeah, I'm a perfect, you know, example of that. Cause it's, you know, this would be 29 for me and I just keep trying Insane. to get better and keep trying to get better and keep trying to figure it out. And, you know, for a guy who's not a professional athlete, I am, I'm constantly going through the learning curve on all those layers by myself and just figuring it out and, you know, learning, learning the hard way that didn't work. That did, this didn't work. That worked. Okay. So, but I've been lucky enough to keep getting in. I, I volunteer, I give back, you know, I do a lot of things to, 
ensure my entry. Um, yeah. So I keep getting to, I keep getting to try, which is, yeah. has been good. <clears throat> and I think that's half of it, right? Is setting a goal each year. Like that's one of the things for Leadville with me, even being a professional is like, you know, there's these standing races every year that are career changers or showstoppers, right? No matter what, if you're professional or if I convince my dad to do it, like the, the feeling of finishing, the feeling of accomplishment of Leadville is unlike most things you feel, right? It's not like Leadville is every race I take on, right? Crossing, touching the red carpet and crossing the finish line with Mary Lee and Ken is like, it, it's the goosebump feeling, right? You can't explain that. And I'm sure there's other races that do it for other people. For me also, like growing up in Michigan, it's a similar feeling to Iceman, like my local home race. But mm -hmm. There's, it's just something special about it, right? It's not like I'm just like, oh, cool, cross another finish line in ninth. That was like an accomplishment. And I was like, okay, what's the next step here? Um, so, and for those who who don't know, Mike almost kicked me off the podcast before we even started because I told him I was old at 29, and he's 20 taking on his 29th <laughs> belt buckle. So, <laughs> yeah, I had to remind him what old looked like right here. Uh, uh. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah, you're 29. Oh my God! If you think about this, this year I will have done as many races as you have lived. <laughs> Woo! It's pretty. It's pretty crazy. See, this is what scares me, though, is I'm getting old. Ah, well, as a cyclist, you're gonna you're gonna age well. That's the nice thing. I, I'm excited. I I'm excited to keep setting goals and just find a way to make things change. Um, but yeah, it's. Yeah. Do you I know? Think that's um, the, go ahead. Do you know Bill Wenmark, Doc? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Doc's what, 77 this year? Yep. 70, and he's, you know, and he's taking it on again. And he's, you know, I mean, Doc is training every day, doing something toward Leadville. And he's, you know, he's planning on being the oldest competitor to finish under 12. So it's inspiring it's and scary because I don't know that I can do that at 77. <laughs> Keep it up. We'll see. Yeah. Plenty so, of time. All right. So what um, you said you've done it three times is, you know, your second race, you got fourth, right? Yeah. So that was a learning year um, coming from the road. I 2022 and 2023, Keegan went away from us on the on Columbine. Um, and they actually played out very similarly in the end. I just finished very different places. Uh, 2022 was my second year. We were just, we all climbed power line together. I had attacked, I had a gap. And at the top, we all kind of came together. There's three of us and we were descending this down Sugarloaf. Inbound? This is yeah, inbound? inbound. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On the way in. Okay. Um, and so on the top of Sugarloaf descending, there was three of us. Keegan was in front. So we were racing for second, third, fourth. Um, and going down Sugarloaf, I just, the other two were on full suspension. So I was on a hard tail and lost the wheel and could see them all the way up Carter summit, but never able to close the gap. And so one of those things were like, I knew I could have finished second or third. I just played my cards wrong. Um, and that stung. And then, you know, 2023, I, we, it was the exact same thing. I just played my cards a little differently. Um, suffered through the whole race and decided the bottom of bottom of uh sugar loaf. I was like, yeah, I don't really care if I fly at this point, I'm not going to get fourth again. And just kind of sent it through the last couple of sections and tagged on. And over the top of Carter Summit, we lost um, Howard, who was, just hadn't eaten perfectly that day. And it was going to be a sprint for second and third. Wow. So we, when you say you play your cards differently, what, uh, you know, what did that mean? What did it look like? Mainly power line. Um, I'm, a, I'm a climber by trade. I enjoy climbing most of the time. Um, Descent as a roadie, descending does not come as easily to me. I've had to learn a lot and kind of find where things fit me well. Mm -hmm. um, like I've learned, for example, for me at Leadville, like I want to play to my strengths. So I want to ride a hardtail that works best for me right now, but I can't do it like Keegan or Cole. I like, I need a dropper post, right? I need to send, spend that extra pound and a bit for a dropper. Um, and so, yeah, so I just held back a little bit on power line this this year or last year as opposed to 2022 and then utilize what i had left with a small gap at the bottom going into carter summit to connect again and then be able to ride my race back with those guys as opposed to being on the back foot um as we hit the asphalt huh 
So you're still going to ride hardtail this year? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I always bring both and check the course out, but I – it's just hard as a professional uh, to leave three pounds on the table when you're – like for us, at least my experience the last three years, the race has come down to Columbine. And, you know, the descents are fast and you need to avoid flatting. <clears throat> but – that's not a bigger the if you think of it it's obviously equal climbing and descending in terms of distance but in terms of time you climb for a lot longer than you do descend and so it's trying right. to find those those you know quote unquote marginal gains when you know we're riding as fast like i never expected to to ride at a 6 hour pace but like this this past year i finished what just a hair over 6 hours and that was second by 25 minutes like it's it was crazy and so um as things get faster and the race just is on all day and there's no respite. Um, yeah. I think all those little things add up. Hmm. And <clears throat> would you change your gearing? To, you know, would that, would that make a difference for you? It's hard. Um, I had this weird feeling. I've never liked certain gears, like on a, a road bike. Like I don't like a 52. I like a 53 or 54 on a, on a mountain bike. I've always loved a 36. I've never liked a 38. Um, and so last year we were doing the last couple of pre-rides and I was talking, hanging out with Keegan and he had a 40 on. And I was obviously the talk of the town and all my friends were changing to 40s or to 38s. And I was just like, that's, I, it just doesn't feel right. I just like, I, I don't know. It just, it, anyway, so I ran up with a 36. I saw a 36 Shimano 1051. And I was stoked on that. I don't think, I would change that. Um, there's always things you can play with, you know, as, as classified gets better and you can run a, an internal gear in your hub or other different things. There's like all these little marginal gains you could think about. But uh, I think overall, I'm just, that is not what's held me back the last couple of years. And I'm very, I'm good at compartmentalizing and being like, this is, these are the things I can fix right now. And so I think as I work through things, gearing is probably a little lower down that marginal gain list for me currently. Really? Hmm. Yeah. I just, I, it worked well, like a 36, 10, 51, 36, 10 is a big gear. Like you better be ripping the whole day to justify riding a 38 or a 40 up Columbine or power line. Oh my God. I mean, you know, that 90% of the Leadville field can't even comprehend running a 40 up Columbine. No. And I, I also mean, think we should say push, that, right? <clears throat> what was that? I think we should say that for any, anyone that I, like, if my dad came or any one of my friends came to Leadville, I would be telling them to ride a full suspension and a 32 or a 34 for most people, because you're, you're either going to be walking or you're going to be able to ride it and enjoy it more. Right. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, and a lot of this, a lot of the emphasis on this show is, um, you know, it's the first timers and a lot of the first timers you know, a, f a fair amount of them are 12 hour bubble racers and those racers, they don't even need to consider a 32 or a 34 unless they're, if you're gifted, all right, that's different. But if you're a 12 hour bubble racer, you need to be talking 30, 28 kind of a gearing because I mean, Columbine and Powerline are just going to, just going to ruin you if, you know, burn all your matches. So yeah, and I think everyone can, who's done level can speak to it, but there's a moment on Columbine. Everyone looks at Columbine and they look at distance. They look at how high you go and they're like, okay. And they're looking at it on the computer as they get higher. And they think I can ride all the way up if I have the gear in. You can't. You're going to be walking no matter what you are, what you're doing. And so it's it just becomes this goat trail. And I think that's something that like people look at Leadville very specifically and they're like, okay, I need to be this fast to here, this fast to here. But you forget if you get tired and you take one minute or sit down in the feed zone, 10 minutes, right? You, you start walking a little earlier than you thought you were five minutes. Like it, the 12 hours in the midst of focusing on a goal goes very quickly. Um, and I think it's always trying to figure out where your weak points are. And even if you think you're the strongest guy coming out of Michigan or Florida or somewhere that doesn't have altitude, just bring the 28 or the 30. You don't have to put it on from the beginning. You can put it on later. But go ride the climbs and then decide that Mike and Alexi were right and we're not being mean. Right. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I coach first timers and just for the course, right? I'm not a fitness coach, but I, I do course coaching. 
for the people who can't get here. And I think St. Kevin is a great barometer. Mm-hmm. You know, go up Kevin with whatever gearing you think you're stud with, you know, back at home, go up Kevin's. And if you're redlining going up Kevin or you're burning matches going up Kevin, that's the wrong gear, you know, 100%. for you personally, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, back it down to where you can clear Kevin, where you can, you know, not be redlining because you've got, you've got a ton more race and a ton more climbing and a ton and a lot more, 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 more. So yeah. make sure that you're not, you know, leaving everything on Kevin's because it's going to hurt later. It's going to change your 100%. day. 100%. 100%. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So then you, your third race, you end up getting second, which was last year. Yep. What was yeah, so the I, one that was a little bit different? You you played your hand differently. and Yeah, the whole race was different, though. Um, so those who don't know Keegan... Keegan won the race the lat all of those years, all the editions I've done it. Um, 2021 was his first edition. It was kind of somewhat normal, still a fast field. 2022, he missed the six hour, missed beating the six hour time by like a second. Right. And going to 2023, he'd focused a lot of his year around it. And Keegan is very, very gifted at altitude. Above 6,000 feet, I would say Keegan is one of the best in the world. Um, especially when you put in his mountain bike skills. And so Keegan's running, you know, 680 bars and a 40 tooth chain ring and narrow tires and gravel wheels. Like his bike is set up to dominate Leadville. Um, And it would be sketchy for most of us to ride down any of the hills. And so there was this air around of like, this is a record setting year and we're all going for that. And so from the get go, Keegan had a teammate and we went off the line. Like we were, I I literally, obviously they had forties and 38s and Lachlan had a 42 I I was th- spinning a 3610 at 140 RPM and barely hanging on. Like 35 miles an hour start into Kevin's. Um and so from there I think there's this big focus on like we this is everyone's going to pull we're going this is going to be really fast. And I actually got dropped on Sugarloaf last year. Um I just wasn't really mentally prepared for it to be that hard. Um, I looked at Leadville as a long day and to me, I was like, I'm ready to race, but I don't, this isn't my record to set. I haven't finished first year the last two years. Um, and so there's a lot of guys just, you know, I think burning a lot of bullets, they probably shouldn't have burned. And as we came into Columbine, everything settled down. I was able to reconnect after fish hatchery going into the, into pipeline, um, which is the first aid station for those who don't know. And so as I reconnected, I was like, just trying to catch my breath catch up on calories, make sure I was, you know, following the things I needed, needed to do. And we came into Columbine and right at the bottom, Keegan just started going harder. And I was like, I don't feel great, but like, I am such a racer. Like I can't let him go. Um, I hate just accepting that you're going to be second that far out. And so I went with Keegan. Uh, I was the only one to go. Nobody went, which I was like annoyed and blown away by. Cause everyone had been yelling at me to pull harder. And I was like, you guys are racing for a record. That's not ours. Um, <laughs> and anyway, it's it kind of just came down. Keegan dropped me three miles in to Columbine. Uh, so I started riding my own race. I knew I was probably going to get picked up by some riders on the way down. And knowing that the descent is my focus point as opposed to climbing, I kind of just, you know, climbed pr- pretty hard, but like 90%, not 100. On top of Columbine to the turnaround, Keegan at this point is probably already three minutes, four minutes ahead of us at the top. Um, get caught by three other guys. We descend down Columbine and uh, start heading inbound, get a couple more guys. I think there was six of us at one point headed back toward, you know, the last 40 miles. Um, Keegan was riding away with the race. We just weren't working well enough. Every time gap we got, it went out another 30 seconds or a minute. Um, And so I think everybody was already thinking about racing for a second. Um, As we started climbing power line, you quickly realize who you're racing. Um, I was probably seemingly suffering most but also i think in my head we're just kind of telling myself just hang on this is not your race right now uh after just previous experiences at leadville Mm. once we got to the top there was uh four of us we lost coal due to a flat on sugar loaf going down just how it happens um and there was three of us at the bottom of carter summit or bottom of the climb up to carter summit uh we dropped one on the way. And so then it was me and 
John on the way. So John, the schema racer, he finished second last year in 2022 or two years ago. And so he's kind of hitting some of those fast parts down Keevans really fast and trying to drop me. Um, we came into, you know, the last, last 10 miles. And I think we both reserved to just riding together, making sure we weren't going to get caught. And so there's a moment where you're just like, after racing flat out for six hours, what do you have left in the sprint? Um, and I think I just got lucky with my roadie background, just tactics wise. Uh, John kind of found himself on the front. Uh, I don't know if he noticed this, but something for me being a roadie, like I looked, okay, he has a bigger gear than me. So he is easily or more easily going to overgear himself in a sprint, which is something that like, I think when you're fatigued matters a lot more. And then I just decided I wanted to go early and hopefully catch by surprise. So he was off the, off the front. We're on the right side on the barriers, um, which is smart by him. He's trying to block me out, but that also means that he better just keep looking at me. And he ended up looking forward one time. And the minute he looked forward, I jumped and it was probably a 30 second sprint to the finish line, not a little less. And I never looked back, but luckily got the gap and he never, never came around. So it was cool. It also felt somewhat weird to be so, to feel so good about a second place and then realize you're 25 minutes behind Keegan who ra just raced his own race to that point. Um, but like I said, I, like it wasn't demoralizing. It's just like, it shows what's possible at Leadville. Like for those people who go out there, like Keegan did a 543 for a hundred and some miles, 104 miles at 10,000 feet. It's unreal. Unreal. I've heard, I heard Jonathan from trainer road say that uh, Keegan only loot. He, He's one of the only people that he knows that only loses about 10% at 12,000 feet. Yeah. Which is and, he, crazy. and past that, I think what people don't understand is that Keegan also has done all of the homework on equipment more than anybody else. And then beyond that is just really, really good as a mountain biker at any altitude. So like, even if I was as good as Keegan power wise, he's better than me downhill. And like all these things is like, he's riding a hardtail on with narrow bars to be more aero and a high post and descending faster than I can, or many people can on a full suspension with a dropper. And so you go, like you look at how fast he climbed up Columbine. He also descended a minute faster than us. But what do you do? You're losing time in every space you can. Um, and I think, wow. yeah, it, it's people argue about it all the time. I don't think 543 will be broken. Maybe ever. I also just think we had a perfect year last year. Like the, well, the conditions great, were superb. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, the weather was great. I interviewed, <clears throat> I was just down with Dave Weens last night. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, Dave's awesome and he was super strong and, you know, champion and all that. And I said, Dave, I, it, Dave but Dave's going to be 60 this year. And I said, all right, Dave, here's the last question. All things equal, you got your 2023 but you're 28 years old. You're in the best shape you've ever been. You've got the best technology. You're lining up on Leadville for 2024. Are you going to do a 540? <laughs> and he did what he he the answer, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I understand people thinking it's possible. I also like, I wish people had had the experience, like climbing Columbine with him. He can never went faster. I just couldn't hold it. Right. And that's like for everybody. We were riding for those who do watts, like I was doing 330, 340 on his wheel at, you know, the bottom of that's what, just on just under eleven thousand feet. <clears throat> and you're he held that all the way up. I didn't really go much faster. I probably went like 320, 310, but like I averaged just over 300 for Columbine. And I was four minutes behind Keegan. And it's, it's just a testament to what it takes. You know, there's a moment where, I don't know if anyone watched Call of a Lifetime, but they have the helicopter filming Keegan going up kind of the first time you hit the steep stuff uh, when it gets chunky, probably, what, two and a half miles from the top. And Keegan's just turning over a 40 like it's his job. And, like, I, I those moments, I, I don't care how strong you are, man. Like, you got to be something special. And it's not that it's not possible, but it's, I don't know. I think you'd need... Keegan and two others to just do work all like you have to set up Leadville to be beat. It wouldn't be a singular person. You'd need a, a team of people. Like it'd be like Keegan paying me off to go ride as hard as I could for the first 40 miles and then huh. saying, okay, fly birdie. <laughs> Interesting. 
Interesting. Yeah. So what what was your uh what was your time last year? I don't know exactly. It was sub six oh five. Sub six oh five. Yeah. And you and you and and you had a, a Tour de France stage sprint at the end? I did I, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Really? I, it was, I was still I mean, out was, on the course, so I have no idea what happened when you guys showed up. <laughs> yeah. Um I mean Lifetime posted they had they had the helicopter out there, so it was cool. They had a really big sprint of it. Um but it's uh I was gonna I was gonna see if I could sh- I could show you, but it's pretty crazy. It's um they had like a full the whole over top sprint. I got it. Ha ha look at that. For a mountain so bike pretty, race, hundred mile It was a big sprint. Race. Yeah, and there's that red carpet awesome. we all dream of. Yeah. <laughs> so all I tried to do is not fall over. So, I mean, it was a really – it's funny because I, I b- believe Leadville is very much like a – for me, it's a somewhat of a romantic race. Like, 2021, one of the – I ran power. And I realized, like, everyone tells you altitude is, like, you just need to trust your body. And what it's telling you on the day is what you need to do. Um, so, yeah, 2022 and 2023, my fourth and second, I haven't run a power meter. And I've been stoked. Like I, I've loved that because I truly just race to my to my limit, right? You you feel it out. Like I probably wouldn't have gone with Keegan on Columbine if I'd stared at a power meter. You just okay. What do I have right now? And oh. each time that changes. And so <clears throat> it's one of those things. Like the sprint. Like I wanted to see what that sprint was numbers wise at the end. Like you want to know like how how hard could I go after six hours of racing that hard? Um, but I also just like you know sometimes it's like the ro- the romance of cycling is what I like why i love the sport so much and um you know all the technology is great but sometimes true sport is just allowing yourself to go as hard as you can on a given day in a given moment and that changes so much i mean there's points of the race last year that i was like cool i'm getting 15th today no problem <laughs> like if you look at time if you look at time gaps there was moments that i was like outside the top 15 by a good bit like 30 seconds 40 seconds off the back of the front group um I just like, I was racing to how I felt. Huh. And, you know, Leadville is, I think also for most people, for professionals, there's definitely a line of like, okay, I need to be in that group to be able to fight for the win. Like if you aren't in the front group going through pipeline, I think you're pretty screwed. Like you're just not going to come back. We ripped so hard from pipeline to twin lakes. Oh yeah. Um, but that being said, like, I think there's, yeah, there's something to be said for just racing your race on the day. Because it doesn't matter what your power meter said a month ago. You're now at 10,000 feet in Leadville doing it yourself. So, Right. And there's and all the other layers of everything else with the weather and the your fueling yeah. and, you know, just, just there's so many things involved. So that's pretty cool. I know that the, yeah. I know yeah. that a lot of the 12 hour bubble racers use, you know, will use their power meters and not to exceed tool. Yeah. You know, so they don't let the, you know, the excitement get a hold of them and, and just end up, you know, emptying the tank before they should. For sure. Yeah. And I think that's where it's helpful, but I think <clears> people <throat> also like as a pro letting it hold you back is such a killer. Like, mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, I'm racing to win whether or not that's a reality the whole day or not. And so if I'm feeling bad and I'm looking down at something, it's not telling me what I want to see or vice versa, that I'm feeling bad or I'm getting dropped, but I'm doing numbers I know I can, then you're just like, well, shit, here I am. But if you feel bad and you don't have anything to quantify it, you're just like, okay, I'm going to pedal harder. That's where they are. The, the wheel is in front of me. Then um, that's the difference, right? There's days where you're like, Leadville is a day where you're like, if I go kaboom, I go kaboom. That's how this race goes. Um, and it, you can't, if you don't race with that panache, you will never be on the podium of Leadville because it's not, it's not defined by power. Huh. Well, yeah, true. <clears throat> Interesting. So yeah. uh, before the show, you and I were talking about your 2024 and you've got some, you've got some other things. Your the, the, you know, the Olympic trials are uh, going to be part of that. So what's your, um, your, what's going to happen? Come Leadville, you're yeah. going to show up, you're going to be super good shape. You're going to be ready or you get rested or you're going to be drained because you're going to the Olympics. Yeah. So um there's two different pathways one is what i've done the last couple of years but just perfecting it so do a little altitude camp um 
focus very intensely on my bill for three to four weeks. Uh, and the other is preparing to possibly take on Paris myself or go support my girlfriend taking on Paris. She's a triathlete. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously if we go to the Olympics, that is Paris is not at altitude. Uh, so I'll be training for Leadville in a very flat area in a city, um, which I think is a weird juxtaposition. Um, but it definitely would change the goals and just change the outcome. Uh, but yeah, if, if the Olympics end up being on the map, either for myself or her, I will get back to Colorado about six days before Leadville. Um, so not ideal in terms of altitude, um, but I would say much more like most people take it on. And I think the the mindset will be a lot about, you know, racing my race on the day and understanding that there's going to be times where I have to let the wheel go and hoping that other people make, make mistakes. Um, I think I would change the starting goal from trying to win to maybe a top five, and just hoping for wheels and the best day I can have. Um, but yeah, I mean, Leadville is not for the faint of heart doing it without any preparation for Leadville and trying to, to win is seemingly impossible. And where do you, like when you do your elevation training, where, where is that at? I don't like going all the way up. Uh, I have a friend who owns a house up in Gold Hill, about 3000 feet above Boulder. So it's like 8,500. Um, so there's times I've thought about going to Leadville and staying for a bit and staying at 10, but I for me, growing up in Michigan, I still think even if you like live in Boulder, your body is still, I lose altitude adaption pretty quick when I leave. And so hopefully getting a good bit at Boulder at 5,500 and then stepping that up to 8,500 is usually a pretty good mix for me where I'm able to train hard um, and not have to spend time, spend as much time recovering. So, you know, I can sleep at 8,500 feet in Gold Hill. I can descend down to 5,500 to train. And so you allow your body as much adaption as possible. Okay. And how, how soon do you go when it, when it's Leadville race time, if it's not Paris in, in the front end, how far in advance do you go to Leadville? Usually like Wednesday. Like usually I'm in, I usually I'll finish my altitude camp, come down to Boulder for a couple of days, have some good nights of sleep and then go up like a Wednesday. Um, you know, check out the couple of things. Usually I go and do a call, do a power line ride, see how the descent's looking. Um, make sure I'm still happy on tire pressures and things like that. Uh, and overall just, you know, be up in Leadville, get the experience, not be stressed about travel or anything else. Right. Well, just, just so you know, uh, we talked about doc <clears throat> doc has a Leadville race party on Tuesday. So if you have the mm. time and you're not in Paris, there is a kind of a um, potluck people bring stuff and he's got his huge grill out in his tent and, he just does That's a, cool. you know, he just does a Leadville party. So if you're in town, it's 94 yeah. Adelaide Court, Leadville, Colorado. And I'm telling everybody this because Bill invites everybody to his get together. So that's awesome. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to the calendar. calendar. <clears throat> um, yeah. Shoot. Where was I going? Oh, you've got your, uh, your show, which last year uh, from the ground up, right? Yep. And I remember seeing you and some people who um, didn't look like they would be in the front of the pack at the camp, right? Yep. So you want to you want to share some of that? You know what, yeah. what what your ground up story is? Yeah. Um, so from the ground up started out of the pandemic. Um, a friend and I had, I had just moved to Colorado, and a friend and I saw this major gap that was opening as new people came into the sport of cycling, whether because their gym closed or needed mental sanity from their family during the pandemic. And there was just a big influx of people and not really anywhere for them to go. If you're coming off a Peloton and there's not a group ride in your local area, how do you get into the sport? Um, and so the original goal of it is how do you somehow make the sport less intimidating, more accessible, but without pros coaching, right? We wanted to give access to normal everyday people and allow them to teach people in their community. And hopefully by proxy, you grow the sport. Um, so the first year we had three people, one for uh, Enzo was from the, from Queens, uh, Roberto's from Boston and Shauna was from uh, Northern Wisconsin. Uh, they all came to Leadville. Nobody, nobody made it past Twin Lakes. Uh, Enzo was the closest. He missed it by 90 seconds. Um, so it wasn't a failure. 
from the ground up is the goal is never the finish line. It's about the the journey. As cliche as that might be, I think anyone who's taken on Leadville can understand. Sometimes it doesn't go the way you want the first year. Um, and so we did, did it again in 2022. Uh, we brought back, same thing. No one made it past Twin Lakes. We kept learning. Uh, all of these things that we think tried to help people be the fastest. The first year we gave all these amateur riders 19 pound hardtails because I thought that was the best way for them to be fast. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> juxtapose that with 2023 where we had some finishers they were on 130 millimeter travel bikes which for anyone racing to go sub nine sounds crazy but we learned that saving energy and being safe in a sense they could train the fitness level to get over the extra pounds they were carrying what they needed was help on the on the descents um and so yeah so 2023 we had Five people actually. We had two ex NFL players, and the goal of that was to show how hard Leadville is, and then three everyday people. Um, we had kind of the perfect mix. We had one ex NFL player finish, one did not, and then we had two of our normal people finish. One finished under twelve and got a belt buckle. The other was she finished last on course. Her and another woman finished in thirteen and a half hours, um, and it's pretty crazy. Like I'll I'll say this a lot, but like my second place finish at Leadville was awesome, but I wasn't like crying or anything else. I was bawling when I was watching like the last people finish. When I was watching Brindley finish, it was just a reminder of like how much goes into something like Leadville and then what it means to someone to finish, right? Like no matter what she does in her life, and I wish she was here to tell you this, she will never struggle to sort things out anymore. Like Leadville is probably one of the hardest things she'll ever do. And so if you get through that, that's the goal of the project is trying to have people understand that you're taking on a seemingly impossible goal. We pick people in early March and the race is in August, right? There's not a lot of time there, less than six months to train. And the goal is that you give them everything they can. They get to fully focus on a goal for themselves for six months and whoever they become at the end of that is awesome. That's success. doesn't really matter beyond that as long as they give their best. Um, and so, yeah, so once everybody finished, we've decided in, in season four from the ground up to move to a different race. But Leadville's will always have that home because I think it was like it was such a journey for us to figure out how to help these people get to the finish line. You know, <clears throat> the 13 and a half hour finish, probably one of the, definitely one of my favorite things to do is I finish – and then I go, uh, I am on this, I'm on the finish line about 11 and a half hours into the race and I'm standing there cheering and, you know, just to, to watch the people come in completely destroyed, absolutely nothing left. But when they get to where they see the red carpet and they see the crowd and the crowd is cheering, all of a sudden, everything about them changes and they realize I am finishing the Leadville Trail 100, and their their body position changes, their their face changes. Their, I mean, you can just see everything conform to victory, whether it's 11:30 or 13:30. They have won. They have beat that course, and it is. I mean, that is to me is just awesome. So, and I, I get what yeah. you're saying. I mean that that 11:59 person that hits Hospital Hill, and you can see the silhouette, and the crowd yeah. is going absolutely crazy. And they make it at eleven fifty nine fifty nine. I mean, it you know, what it, that's a Tour de France victory yeah. for them. It's, and it's know. also just inspiring, right? Like, oh. <clears throat> Leadville is not meant to be raced like everyone does it, in my opinion, right? It's you're you're taking on the wilderness, you're taking on nature. You never know what's going to happen. Um, and yeah, I just think it's it just reminds you, right? The amount of people that t- say. They've done Leadville because they happened to be in Leadville or driving through Leadville and they just saw someone finish and they were like, I should come do that. It's, it's crazy. Like the race is just intoxicating and it kind of spreads like, like, like a good virus, right? It just kind of gets into everyone's veins. And like if someone talks about Leadville and someone else is like, huh, I saw something about that one time. And yeah, I mean, I, I am obviously biased, but from the ground up, especially season three is on like all the seasons are, but season three is spectacular on YouTube. 
and it's you watch the last episode it's about an hour and five minutes so next time you're on the trainer it's you watch people finish and you watch people get through time cuts that no one ever had and it's it's amazing it's like it's it's, it's the most like energy creating thing i've ever watched and that's kind of the goal of from the ground up is hopefully you watch it and you want to get off the couch not watch another series and i think you know i don't know it's i feel special i feel special yeah my brother um he got in and he had you know it just it was wrong timing for him for the race uh and he was not prepared and he he did not make he got cut off at twin lakes outbound and mm -hmm. him and this other guy that were riding together, they both they both missed the cutoff, and though they both broke down uh, in tears, uh, just of the emotional overload of, you know, whatever that is, and it just is, it is crazy. It doesn't matter if you make the cutoff or not. You're so invested emotionally in this thing, you know, unbelievable. Yeah, and even like we had that, and I think that's I'll reiterate that our first two years, nobody made it past Twin Lakes outbound. Nobody made it past 40 miles. And that was a success for a lot of those people. Um, sure. This year, we had one of our, one of our riders, Megan Mauser. She made it past and she rode all the way up Columbine, even though she knew she wasn't going to make it. But it's crazy. They're sitting there with the time clock. And it's one of the most like, you're about to ball because she makes it by seconds. Like literally the last rider to be allowed through Twin Lakes. And it's just like, your body, you can't keep up with like, the feelings that you're feeling in that moment. And you're not even there. It's just someone filming it. And I, yeah, it's, it's emotional. And that's, I think that's what makes a bill special, right? It makes you feel everything. It makes you feel horrible. makes you feel angry. makes you feel special. And I think, you know, you put all those, all those feelings together and that is, that's life, right? If we're able to, to somehow figure out why we're feeling these things, um, I don't know. That's the best of human nature. Right. And I think <clears throat> it's interesting. The, the, I think the underdog story is just an, an underlying part of Leadville. You know, Leadville 100%. itself was, there was no greater underdog than the city or town of Leadville when the mine went under. Yep. And, you know, they, they won, they came back and the underdog won, you know, Leadville's thriving now. And there are so many people, there's so many individual stories of uh, people who are underdogs. And they take it on and they, they, they dig deep and they find things out about themselves that they never knew. And they either, they either make it to Twin Lakes on time and that's their victory or they make it to the red carpet. You know, that's their victory. It's, you know, yeah. the underdog story is definitely something about Leadville period. Yeah. There's a, there's a guy, Tony Dultz. He, he had lung cancer. Mm-hmm. And he went and got a piece of his lung removed, I think I 30, 40 days before the race. And he's, you know, because he said that he was going to do Leadville, he showed up and was on the starting line with 25% of one of his lungs removed and still had it. He still had the scar that he was nursing and did Leadville. And he got, I think he said he got to twin lakes uh, inbound. And he said, that mm -hmm. was my goal. And I did it. And I mean, he it, he he might he could have won the race. It wouldn't have mattered, right? No. He was so happy that he so did true. it. Awesome, 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 awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> well, do you have any other tips? You know, any other advice you could share with first timers? If you're going to take on Leadville, commit to it. I don't know. I think that's the biggest thing. Is Leadville's possible for anybody? I think that's what from the ground up proved to me but you can't underestimate it and you have to commit to it. It's not a race you can just show up to and expect it to go your way. Um, I think most racing is like that where, you know, if something's going to go wrong and deal with something here or there, Leadville will remind you that you're just a piece. You're just a pawn being moved around the board. Um, but at the end of the day, when, if you do finish or you do get to your, to make, meet your goal, whatever that might be, it's an insane feeling. And I, like I said, there's, it's not a normal feeling for every race. Leadville is iconic and special for a reason. Um, and even just the minute you show up in town at 10,000 feet, you kind of realize it's just, this is, this is special. This is something I'll remember for the rest of my life. So commit. 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 I mean, Ken, yeah. Ken tells you too, but I'll, I'll start it now. 
<laughs> right. And I and, and I always tell people, you cannot cram for this test. This is the one test you cannot cram for. So yeah. start early. And you're ground up people that start in March, man. That's a late start in in you know in general, right? We'd we'd love to start earlier. That's the hard part about running a project like this. You gotta pick people, you gotta get bikes that fit. Um, it's a hundred percent of a late start. And I think that's one of the things that makes the project special though, is that it's because the goal of the project isn't Leadville. Leadville is that vehicle, right? With the bike that takes you there. It's setting your mind to something that you've watched people fail at over and over and over. And for some reason you think somewhere deep inside your crazy mind, you can do it. And it's not that you think you're better. You just, you think you're going to commit yourself enough to get it done. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's what makes from the ground up special is it's just taking on something impossible. And then there's that tiny infinitesimal percentage that you can get across the finish line. Yeah, no, I, cause you know, Ironman similar. I've done, you know, I've done Ironman races before and they're awesome, right? It's an, it's an awesome accomplishment, but it's not Leadville. No. Just, it's I just, try, I've, we've had a lot of people say that we've had like a lot of people apply and they're like, They've done multiple Ironmans and they think that Leadville is going to be not a cakewalk, but like, okay, yeah, you know, I suffered through the bike. I was like 112 miles on asphalt does not prepare you for walking at 12,500 feet <laughs> and your feet hurt and every step you take the rock shifts underneath you and you have to carry and push your bike, which is, you just want to leave there and walk back to it. <laughs> and I, yeah, it's, it's like, a, it's a beautiful, horrible thing. But Leadville, that's what Leadville is, is it's that we're all going to have that moment. We go, why the hell am I doing this right now? And then you get to figure out why. Right. <clears throat> so what's your what's your prediction? Are you going to be doing Leadville for the next 15 years? Is it, you know, a couple times and moving on or where are you at with that? I don't know. Do you know? I think. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, right now, <clears throat> I wouldn't say I'm like. I'm not like, oh, I need to go for a 10, 10 years or 20 years. I think I'm just want to keep finding my reason for racing. And I think if I can go from trying to race at the front to enjoying it, or like, I think there needs to be a transition year somewhere where I do it with a friend or my dad or somebody. Um, but it's special. And especially living two hours from it, I don't see a reason why I wouldn't go back for the next couple of years five years, 10 years, 15 years. I just got to find the reason why and where and how, um, because I think, you know, we were talking about this before we started filming, right? It's, it's easy to, to be competitive about things you don't have to be competitive about, even if you're not racing for the win. Uh, and so I want to find that, that line where I'm happy and doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. Well, don't you think a uh, Leadville thousand mile buckle I know, and you, you got real... and you got the two thousand mile behind you, and you're going right for there, a three thousand yeah. mile. Don't you think this would look really good next to Olympic medal? I, I yeah, I would, but I I got to keep I got to keep doing. It. I got a long way to go. <laughs> Seven oh, years goodness. seems daunting, let alone seventeen. <clears throat> oh, all right. Well, I just you know I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day. That was awesome. I really appreciate you know you sharing your experiences and just your insight on Leadville and. You know, love it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this, Mike. And uh, yeah, anyone who's listening, you're always welcome to reach out on Instagram. My email's connected to my Instagram either way. So if Mike doesn't have the answers, I probably don't either, but you're welcome to reach out. <laughs> and what's your Instagram? Uh, it's at Alexi Mielin, my name. Okay, there you go. All right, racers. Just want to remind you, this is Mike with the YouTube channel, Get My Buckle. Also, uh, CTS, Carmichael Training Systems, is they're waiving the athlete registration fee of 79 bucks if you use the code GETMYBUCKLE to engage CTS as your coaching staff. Also, and um, Bird Wheels, Rope Spoke, Carbon Hoops, Super Light, Super Comfortable, they're aligned with us as well. Bird Buckle 2024, B-E-R-D, Buckle 2024, gets you 10% off a wheel set. So... Keep that in mind, and we'll see you at the finish line. Thanks.